This is Chapter 10 of Pride and Prejudice. Jane and Elizabeth are still stuck at Netherfield until Jane gets over her cold. Chapter 10. The day passed much as the day before had done. Mrs. Hurst and Miss Bingley had spent some hours of the morning with the invalid, the person who's sick, in this case Jane, who continued, though slowly, to mend. And in the evening, Elizabeth joined their party in the drawing room. The loo table, however, did not appear. Mr. Darcy was writing, and Miss Bingley, seated near him, was watching the progress of his letter and repeatedly calling off his attention by messages to his sister. Mr. Hurst and Mr. Bingley were at piquet, and Mrs. Hurst was observing their game. Elizabeth took up some needlework and was sufficiently amused in attending to what passed between Darcy and his companion. The perpetual commendations of the lady, either on his handwriting or the evenness of his lines or on the length of his letter, with the perfect unconcern with which her praises were received, formed a curious dialogue and was exactly in, her, in unison with her opinion of each. So Elizabeth mentioned that she's a people watcher. She likes to observe what others do. Um, and she's watching Mr. Darcy and Caroline Bingley. Mr. Darcy's writing a letter to his sister and Miss Bingley just keeps commenting on it all the time, trying to get his attention. Um, he's just focused on writing. So it's a pretty comic scene. Um, Elizabeth is amused by it and will hopefully be too. How delighted Miss Darcy will be to receive such a letter. He made no answer. You write uncommonly fast. You are mistaken. I write rather slowly. How many letters you must have occasion to write in the course of a year? Letters of business, too. How odious I should think them. It is fortunate, then, that they fall to my lot instead of to yours. Pray tell your sister that I long to see her. I have already told her so once by your desire. I am afraid you do not like your pen. Let me mend it for you. I mend pens remarkably well. Thank you, but I always mend my own. How can you contrive to write so even? He was silent. Tell your sister I am delighted to hear of her improvement on the harp, and pray let her know that I am quite in raptures with her beautiful little design for a table, and I think it infinitely superior to Miss Grantley's. Will you give me leave to defer your raptures till I write again? At present I have not room to do them justice. Oh, it is of no consequence. I shall see her in January. But do you always write such charming long letters to her, Mr. Darcy? They are generally long, but whether always charming, it is not for me to determine. It is a rule with me that a person who can write a long letter can, with ease cannot write ill. That will not do for a compliment to Darcy, Caroline, cried her brother, because he does not write with ease. He studies too much for words of four syllables. Do not you, Darcy? My style of writing is very different from yours. So Mr. Bingley is kind of poking fun at Mr. Darcy. They are very good friends. Um, so he says, oh, he doesn't write so easily, Caroline. He has to think of these fancy four-syllable words. Um, so it takes him a while to write these letters. And uh, Mr. Darcy just says, my writing style is very different from yours. Oh, cried Miss Bingley. Charles writes in the most careless way imaginable. He leaves out half his words and blots the rest. My ideas flow so rapidly that I have not time to express them, by which means my letters sometimes convey no ideas at all to my correspondence. Your humility, said Eliz Mr. Bingley, said Elizabeth, must disarm her proof, um, by which she means, because you're so humble, we can't really blame you for writing careless letters. Nothing is more deceitful, said Darcy, than the appearance of humility. It is often only carelessness of opinion and sometimes an indirect boast. Um, Darcy's kind of teasing Bingley back um, right there. So he's he's saying really that, um, you know, saying you're careless in your letter writing and being humble, um, that may not really be a sincere trait. Sometimes people are just humble because they don't have opinions. Um, and other times they're, you know, doing sort of a humble brag. They're being humble, but they really want attention or want to praise their own qualities. And which of the two do you call my little recent piece of modesty? So that's Mr. Bingley talking and he's saying, well, which one is it, what I just said? Do you think that I'm indirectly boasting or that I just don't have an opinion? The indirect boast, for you are really proud of your defects in writing because you consider them as proceeding from a rapidity of thought and carelessness of execution, which, if not estimable, you think at least highly interesting. The power of doing anything with quickness is always much prized by the possessor and often without any attention to the imperfection of the, of the performance. When you told Mrs. Bennet this morning that if you ever resolved on quitting Netherfield, you should be gone in five minutes, you meant it to be a sort of pan panegyric, 
a compliment to yourself, and yet what is there so very laudable in the precipitants of which must leave very ne necessary business undone, and can be, be of no real advantage to yourself or anyone else? So, Mr. Darcy says, you were boasting about your ability, indirectly boasting, before. Um, you were trying to say that you think very quickly, um, and if not, um, if your carelessness in writing isn't worthy, it's interesting. So you're trying to get some sort of attention. And he's saying all this playfully because they are good friends. Um, he also mentions uh, in the previous chapter, he said that he would leave Netherfield very quickly if he had to go. Uh, Mr. Darcy said that's kind of careless of you to do because you're going to leave some necessary business, something important, you'll leave undone um, or forgotten. Nay, cried Bingley, this is too much to remember at night all the foolish things that were said in the morning. And yet, upon my honor, I believed what I said of myself to be true, and I believe it at this moment. At least, therefore, I did not assume the character of needless precipitance merely to show off before the ladies. So he's saying, I really would leave quickly if I had to, and I wasn't just trying to show off. I still, you know, think that I would do that. I dare say you believed it, but I am by no means convinced that you would be gone with such celerity. Your conduct would be quite as dependent on chance as that of any man I know. And if, as you were mounting a horse, a friend were to say, Bingley, you had better stay till next week, you would probably do it. You would probably not go. And at another word, might stay a month. So, again, Mr. Darcy's kind of teasing him, but he's saying, if someone said to you, oh, never mind, stay here for another month, you just turn around. So, Darcy's pointing out that he can be easily convinced because he's so agreeable. You have only proved by this, cried Elizabeth, that Mr. Bingley did not do justice to his own disposition. You have shown him off much nor now much more than he did himself. I am exceedingly gratified, said Bingley, by your converting what my friend says into a compliment on the sweetness of my temper. But I am afraid you are giving it a turn which that gentleman did by no means intend. For he would certainly think the better of me if, under such a circumstance, I were to give a flat denial and ride off as fast as I could. So, Mr. Bingley saying, oh, you're being too nice, Elizabeth. Um, you're giving him too much credit. He thinks that it would be better if I just made up my mind and left. Would Mr. Darcy then consider the rashness of your original intention as atoned for by your obstinacy in adhering to it? So, Elizabeth saying, okay, well, if... That's the case. Would he think that you quickly deciding to go um, would be made up for by your your obstinacy, your sticking to that decision to leave? Upon my word, I cannot explain the matter. Darcy must speak for himself. So Bingley says, oh, ask him, don't ask me. You expect me to account for opinions which you choose to call mine, but which I have never acknowledged. So this is Mr. Darcy talking. He's saying, I didn't say that if he was obstinate and determined that that would definitely be better. Allowing the case, however, to stand according to your representation, you must remember, Miss Bennet, that the friend who is supposed to desire his return to the house at the delay of his plan has merely desired it, asked it without offering one argument in favor of its propriety. Keep in mind, this is all a hypothetical situation that they're talking about, just discussing what they would do. Um, so what Mr. Darcy says is, in your hypothetical situation, Elizabeth, you haven't explained why the friend wants him to stay at Netherfield. Um, we don't know what the friend's motives were, what the reason was, why the friend is saying that. We have to know more information. To yield readily, easily, to the persuasion of a friend is no merit with you. So that's Elizabeth saying, okay, to listen to your friends is not an important value to you, Mr. Darcy. To yield without conviction is no compliment to the understanding of either. So Mr. Darcy now says to agree to something without being sure of why doesn't help anyone. You appear to me, Mr. Darcy, to allow nothing for the influence of friendship and affection. A regard for the requester would often make one readily yield to a request, without waiting for arguments to reason one into it. I am not particularly speaking of such a case as you have uh, supposed about Mr. Bingley. We may as well wait, perhaps, till the circumstance occurs before you discuss the discretion of his behavior thereupon. But in general and ordinary cases between friend and friend, where one of them is desired by the other to change a resolution of no very great moment, should you think ill of that person for complying with the desire without waiting to be argued into it? 
So Elizabeth says, you know, if your friend um, wants you to do something, do you always need a valid reason? Do you always have to have some sort of argument or rationale behind it? Isn't it enough to trust your friends? Will it not be advisable before we proceed on this subject to arrange with ma rather more precision the degree of importance which is to appertain to this request, as well as the degree of intimacy subsisting between the parties? So now Mr. Darcy says back, okay, well, if we're going to follow this hypothetical scenario, shouldn't we first figure out why the request is so important and if it's important or not important, and then also the degree of intimacy, so how well these two people know each other before making a decision. By all means, cried Bingley, let us hear all the particulars, not forgetting their comparative height and size, for that will have more weight in the argument, Miss Bennet, than you may be aware of. I assure you that if Darcy were not such a great tall fellow in comparison with myself, I should not pay him half so much deference. I declare I do not know a more awful object than Darcy on particular occasions and in particular places, at his own house especially, and of a Sunday evening when he has nothing to do. So Mr. Bingley turns it all back into um, more of a joke than a hypothetical um, debate anymore. So he, he kind of just kids about the whole thing and says, oh, if we're going to take into account how long the people knew each other and all of that, we might as well talk about how tall they are and what everyone's size is and all of that stuff. And he says Darcy's really imposing and um, intimidating sometimes because he's so tall and especially when he's at his house. So he's saying he would be, in a, in a joking way, he's saying he would definitely be convinced by Darcy just because of his height. Mr. Darcy smiled, but Elizabeth thought she could perceive that he was rather offended and therefore checked her laugh. Miss Bingley warmly resented the indignity he had received in an expostulation with her brother for talking such nonsense. I see your design, Bingley, said his friend. You dislike an argument and want to silence this. Perhaps I do. Arguments are too much like disputes. If you and Miss Bennet will defer yours till I am out of the room, I shall be very thankful. And then you may say whatever you like of me. So Bingley says, yeah, I was just trying to put out any potential arguments or tension. Um, you know, can you can you really blame me for it? And if I leave the room, you guys can argue all, all you want. What you ask, said Elizabeth, is no sacrifice on my side. And Mr. Darcy had much better finish his letter. Mr. Darcy took their advice and did finish his letter. When that business was over, he applied to Miss Bingley and Elizabeth for the indulgence of some music. Miss Bingley moved to, with alacrity to the piano forte, and after a polite request that Elizabeth would lead the way, which the other as politely and more earnestly navigated, she seated herself. Mrs. Hurst sang with her sister, and while they were thus employed, Elizabeth could not help observing, as she turned over some music books that lay on the instrument, how frequently Mr. Darcy's eyes were fixed on her. She hardly knew how to suppose that she could be an object of admiration to so great a man, and yet that he should look at her because he disliked her was still more strange. She could only imagine, however, at last, that she drew his notice because there was a something about her more wrong and reprehensible, according to his ideas of right, than in any other person present. The supposition did not pain her. She liked him too little to care for his approbation. So Elizabeth notices that Mr. Darcy is looking at her and she can't possibly imagine after he called her just tolerable um, at the last ball that he's interested in her. So she thinks, OK, he's got to be looking at me because he expects me to do something annoying or because he thinks I am doing something wrong already. After playing some Italian songs, Miss Bingley varied the charm by a lively Scotch air. And soon afterwards, Mr. Darcy, drawing near Elizabeth, said to her, do you not feel a great inclination, Miss Bennet, to see such an opportunity of dancing a reel? She smiled, but made no answer. He repeated the question with some surprise at her silence. So now he's actually asking her to dance. Uh, Lizzie's probably mystified because she just remembers he doesn't want to dance with her at the last ball, and she says nothing. So he asks again. Oh, she, said she, I heard you before, but I could not immediately determine what to say in reply. You wanted me, I know, to say yes, that you might have the pleasure of despising my taste. But I always dislike in overthrowing those kinds of schemes and cheating a person of their premeditated contempt. I have, therefore, made up my mind to tell you that I do not want to dance a reel at all, and now despise me if you dare. Indeed, I do not dare. 
So Elizabeth says back, um, I didn't know what to say when you first asked me, and I figured that you wanted me to say yes, so then you could make fun of me for saying yes, that I wanted to dance. So now I'm going to tell you no, and you can hate me if you like. And then he says, nope, I don't hate you. Elizabeth, having rather expected to affront him, was amazed at his gallantry, but there was a mixture of sweetness and archness in her manner, which made it difficult for her to affront anybody. And Darcy had never been so bewitched by any woman as he was by her. He really believed that, were it not for the inferiority of her connections, he should be in some danger. So he's thinking to himself, oh, I could really like this girl if I didn't realize that she has family that's beneath me and that she has lower class um, family members like Mrs. Bennet, who kind of does things that are not socially acceptable. Miss Bingley saw or suspected enough to be jealous. And her, and, great, and her great anxiety for the recovery of her dear friend Jane received some assistance from her desire of getting rid of Elizabeth. She often tried to provoke Darcy into disliking her guest by talking of their supposed marriage and planning his happiness in such an alliance. So now we kind of move from that really specific moment to just more generally how everything is going at Netherfield. Um, so Caroline Bingley is now getting jealous of Elizabeth and Darcy, even though Elizabeth does not like him. Um, she um, wants, uh, wants Jane to get better, not just so that she can, you know, feel okay, but so that Elizabeth can go home and get out of Netherfield and leave Mr. Darcy clear for her. Um, and she often tries to revoke Mr. Darcy into disliking her guest. So she tries to get Darcy to not like Elizabeth by teasing him about possibly marrying her and what a disaster that would be. I hope, said she, as they were walking together in the shrubbery the next day, you will give your mother-in-law a few hints when this desirable event takes place as to the advantage of holding her tongue. And if you can compass it, do cure the younger girls of running after the officers. And, if I may mention so delicate a subject, endeavor to check that little something bordering on conceit and impertinence which your lady possesses. So she's saying, oh, listen, you know, before uh, before you get married to Lizzie, ha ha ha, um, make sure that you stop her mother from being really obnoxious um, and make her hold her tongue, tongue stop talking. Um, stop Kitty and Lydia from going crazy after all the militia guys that they're interested in, and stop Elizabeth from being obnoxious and impertinent. Have you anything else to propose for my domestic felicity? Oh yes, do let the portraits of your uncle and Aunt Phillips be placed in the gallery at Pemberley. Put them next to your great uncle the judge. They are in the same profession, you know, only in different lines. As for your Elizabeth's picture, you must not attempt to have it taken, for what painter could do justice to those beautiful eyes? So she again makes fun of the fact that the Bennets have lawyers in the family, um, which again she would look down on as someone who inherited some wealth um, that people have earned their money for a living. Um, and then she's also again teasing him about the, the nice eyes. It would not be easy indeed to catch their expression, but their color and shape and the eyelashes, so remarkably fine, might be copied. So he doesn't rise to the occasion, um, just sort of brushes her off and says, oh, you can get some parts of her eyes, even if you can't capture the expression in a painting. At that moment, they were met from another walk by Mrs. Hurst and Elizabeth herself. I did not know that you intended to walk, said Miss Bingley in some confusion, lest they had been overheard. You used us abominably ill, answered Mrs. Hurst, running away without telling us that you were coming out. Then, taking the disengaged arm of Mr. Darcy, she left Elizabeth to walk by herself. The path just admitted three. Mr. Darcy felt their rudeness and immediately said, This walk is not quite wide enough for a party. We had better go into the avenue. So, um, Caroline um, and Darcy are walking together, and then Mrs. Hurst and Elizabeth are also walking. Um, Mrs. Hurst just totally ditches Elizabeth so that she and Caroline can walk on either side of Mr. Darcy, um, and only three people can fit on the walk, which is really awkward. And Mr. Darcy actually says, oh, we should go somewhere where, we're, where we can all walk together. It's too narrow for four of us. But Elizabeth who had not the least inclination to remain with them, laughingly answered, No, no, stay where you are. You are charmingly grouped and appear to uncommon advantage. The picturesque would be spoilt by admitting a fourth. Goodbye. She then ran gaily off, rejoicing as she rambled about in the hope of being at home again in a day or two. 
Jane was already so much recovered as to intend leaving her room for a couple of hours that evening. So Elizabeth doesn't care that they're going to walk without her. She actually is happy to have an excuse to go away. And Jane seems to be recovering, so she's looking forward to going home. And that is the end of chapter 10.